Hello YouTube, this is Tomstead39, and I just want to update you on some things, so I moved out a month ago. Yeah, I don't live here anymore, which is sort of why this is one of the last few segments that you'll see at my grandparents' house. This obviously, of course, means that the remaining of this video will be shot at my current residence in Capitola. So anyways, enjoy the remainder of the video. In an age of mainstream news attacking alternate news, it helps to have a global perspective. Now, well, it's a fact of life. We live in a culture of complaining. I mean, people complain about their bosses, people complain about their mothers, people complain about their fathers, people complain about their kids and their spouses. People complain about video games, people complain about music, people complain about cars, people complain about electronics, people complain about, well, anything there is to complain about. In fact, this time in history is one of the easiest times to complain about stuff, you know? As mundane as it might be, as nonsensical as it might be, you can put a complaint into your phone or your tablet or your whatever, and you could have it heard by the entirety of cyberspace. Even if no one actually reads it, you still have your complaints heard. I mean, sometimes there's even perfectly justified reasons to complain, like... Say you're at a convenience store, and you're trying to purchase a snack, but the man behind the counter is too busy smoking crack. Yes, complain. That is the perfect time to complain. But these days, complaining seems like it only serves to advance a political ideology. We've seen the left do it, we've also seen the right do it. We've seen this during the elections with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, the left versus the right. We've seen this with the British general election, you know, Brexit versus Remain, the right versus the left. And we've even seen this in the French election between Le Pen and Macron, the left versus the right. But let me tell you about an election in a country that you probably haven't heard of. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the DR Congo as Google Maps calls it. But anyway, the DR Congo is a country that's centered within the center of Africa. I don't know if that sounds redundant, but that's where it is, and that's where the map shows it is, so I guess it must be true. And now for some details about the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the uninitiated, as compiled by the United Nations Human Development Reports. And the Human Development Indicators show that it is number 176 on the Human Development list. So, dirt roads, here we come. And for the curious, the index is 0.435. And if we go down there at the trends, we can see that the index has gone below 0.4, has dipped when during the Congo Crisis, or the crux of the Congo Crisis, and then it's gone back up, with no real progress made on anything else, and, you know, we'll get into that. And as far as going down the list, for for health, the average life expectancy is 59.1 years, and the expected years of schooling is 9.8 years, which means, on average, they don't even graduate high school. And of course, the gross national income is $680 per capita, which is, quite frankly, rather abysmal. And as for the inequality adjusted HDI, or the IHDI for short, it is 0.297 and we'll get into that shortly. The gender development index is 0.832, so this is one of those African countries that don't make their women wear the hijab all the time. And as for the multidimensional poverty index, that is 0.369, again, we'll get into that. The employment to population ratio is 68.4% for ages 15 and older. The homicide rate per 100,000 people is 12.5. And if you are to go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, just be careful, you know, just pack some pepper spray, make sure you got your wallet safe. Just in general, be careful when you go there, please do. I worry about you. And as far as the imports and exports, they make up 64.5% of the GDP. And as far as internet users, they are a tiny 3.8% of the population who use the internet. So if someone from the Democratic Republic of the Congo is actually watching this video, then I have found a unicorn. And as far as environmental sustainability, the carbon dioxide emissions per capita is surprisingly small with 0, 0.0 tons. 
Who'd have thought that one of the poorest countries in the entire world would have the smallest carbon footprint? And as far as demography, the population in total is 77.3 million. So yes, a lot of people live in that hole. But what about the election, I hear you ask? Well, funny you should say that. DR Congo cannot afford $1.8 billion to organize 2017 polls. The Democratic Republic of the Congo cannot afford the cost of holding elections this year. According to Minister of State in charge of budget Pierre Canguida Mbayi, the $1.8 billion needed to organize the polls was out of reach. At a press conference held on Wednesday, the minister said he doubted if the DRC could raise the amount and time for polls to hold. It will be difficult to think that we can mobilize 1.8 billion US dollars this year. At this stage, I prefer to keep a language of sincerity, he said. Congo government. Elections are too expensive, so we may not have one this year. The ruling government in Congo has indicated that it may not hold long-awaited elections this year. Why? It's simply too expensive, a government official suggested this week. It will be difficult to think that we can mobilize $1.8 billion this year, Pierre Canguida Mbayi, Minister of State in charge of budget, said at a news conference on Wednesday, African News reported. At this stage, I prefer to keep a language of sincerity. I mean, to be fair, $1.8 billion is a very large amount of money, especially when some African nations are only running on $4, $5 billion for their entire GDP. I'm not making this up. I'm showing the statistics right here on screen. So a fourth of the national budget to a fifth of the national budget is quite a huge chunk out of the entire GDP. That could go to military spending. That could go to other social programs to help people out of poverty. Maybe that's the case for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, too. Well, 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 what do we have here? I'm sorry, we can't afford to pay $1.8 billion. We just have $35 billion right back here behind this couch. Yes, we do. Right here is the Democratic Republic of the Congo National Bank right back here. But oh, no, 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 we can't afford to pay it. We cannot afford to pay for the election. We can't afford to pay the election even when we've got the money to. Well, that's bull****, I hear you say. Well, it gets better. Congo voter registration hampered by insecurity, logistical challenges. As negotiations continue in the Democratic Republic of the Congo on implementing the political deal paving the way for elections before the end of the year, the National Electoral Commission, CENI, has forged ahead with its voter registration process. Instead of just registering the youth who came of age since the last elections in 2011, members of the diaspora are now allowed to vote. CENI has decided to start from scratch and redo the entire voter list, ostensibly to clean up the voter rolls and address the allegations of fraud. But some see this as a government tactic to delay elections once again. CENI announced last week that about 13 million voters have already been registered. They are due to complete the registration by July. In 2011, there were about 32 million registered voters. The process has been marred by various security and logistical challenges that highlight just how difficult organizing elections is in the Congo. The North Kivu region in the east of DR Congo is in a state of panic. Following the announcement that the ex combatants of the M23 rebel fighters won't return to their home in the region, the rebel group had reignited. The M23 rebels, or the March 23rd movement, caused all kinds of chaos throughout the eastern part of the DRC. Anything from raping villagers, kidnapping children, and even taking over some of the towns, all in the name of resources. Yes, they wanted access to some of the minerals by doing an insurrection against the DR Congo with backing from Rwanda. And to top it all off, Rwanda consistently denied backing them, even though when they were defeated, evidence surfaced of Rwanda backing them. Anyway, that's a whole other mess that I'm not really geared to talk about within this video. 
But what you do need to know is that these guys, while they were originally defeated in 2013, um, they took refuge in Uganda for the better part of five years, and now they're back. And people are f***ing terrified. The M23 cut my leg. I'll never forget it. It was in broad daylight in July 2012. That's why I don't want to see them here, and no one wants to see them again. If the M23 comes back, I will leave. I have not forgotten the ill treatment I have suffered. I cannot resist if these M23 fighters arrive here, because with them it's always war. Now, I could see how the resurgence of the M23 would put people off. You know, the M23 rebellions only happened between 2012-2013, four years ago. And people would have that still fresh in their minds. People remembered, you know, them killing people, raping people, you know, taking over towns and villages. And if I were them, I wouldn't want to register to vote either. Because either way, I'm going to get killed, possibly, irregardless of how I vote or who I vote for, even if the election is going to happen at all. So, I'd be more fixated on survival. In fact, come to think of it, I wouldn't be old enough to vote anyways because the registration people don't even focus on trying to register those who came of age. They just want to focus on getting as many people and into the diaspora to, to vote. So, I wouldn't even be able to vote anyways if I were Congolese. But either way, these even if I was old enough, they would still put me off. I'd still remember all the chaos and havoc they caused. And the presence of them, especially how they fought against the Congolese authorities and whatnot, I would be worried. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't want to register to vote. You know, I'd be more fixated on survival. So, even though it may sound laughable, it's a toss-up that's literally between possible life and possible death, and the unpredictability of what they might do after they had been defeated four years earlier. Nobody knows. It's all very uncertain. But I suppose this is the opportunity where I should talk about the DR Congo's very diverse economy. I mean, it's not just, you know, agriculture. I mean, sure, there's a lot of poultry fields and whatnot, but no. There's oil. There's mining operations. You know, it's a very mineral-rich country with many opportunities for economic output. And who are the men behind it? Or more accurately, who are the boys behind it? Yes, these boys are actually working in a real copper mine just outside of Kinshasa. A sad sight to behold, but he oversees a country that has child labor. And, not, and to add insult to injury, the DR Congo is Africa's largest producer of copper. So just think that copper that might have wound up into your phone chargers might have been mined out by that boy. If child labor wasn't enough for you, what if I told you that the Congolese franc, the currency for the DR Congo, was inflating, but the average wage is decreasing? So... The conversion factor in 2015 was 990 francs per dollar. Now, in 2017, that number has gone up to 1,050 francs per dollar. But the average wage went down from 100 bucks a month to 50 bucks a month. Yikes. And to top it off, um, public schools cost money. Not from the taxpayer, from the consumer, yes. Even primary school has a tuition of 150 to 200 francs. So, you have already poor people, very, very poor people. And so, wouldn't that be an inconvenience every semester to have to pay for the new tuition, even if it's very cheap? You know, it adds up considerably. And... If you're not to have a free public education, then what's even really the point of having education at all if it's going to cost money no matter what school you're going to go to? Obviously, this creates what I think a classist mentality within the Congolese sort of sphere of classes and economics or whatever other functions. 
you don't have to have a degree in economics to know that this is a very dangerous case. And to make matters worse, Eastern Congo isn't the only place where there's unrest. Oh, oh no. If you want something even worse, look no further than the Kasai region. The Kamwinan Sapu insurgency has terrorized many parts of the Kasai, Kasai Oriental, Kasai Central, Lomami, and Sankuru provinces. And they are essentially African folk fundamentalists. No, I'm not making that up. And back in 2016, after the killing of the hereditary chief Nsapu, hence the name of the movement, um, people didn't take too kindly to that. And ever since then, there has been over 200 deaths and 40 beheaded police officers. It's so bad that there's 40 mass graves throughout the region. 40 mass graves. I wish I was making this up. They carry around little totes because they believe it grants them immunity. <laughs> Remember how I said they were African fundamentalists? Yeah, they exist too. And it's gotten so bad that they, that the people there, some of the people there, fled from one third world hole, the DR Congo, to another third world hole, Angola. And I'm probably going to get into Angola in a pre in in an upcoming video. Bakash, na shumu kilipu ya balum. Asano kwenye zamani wakamina safari. Muni kumpala wakamina safari kwenye jita pulula. Muni kumpala wakamina safari kwenye jita pulula. Nika kwenye miapu yibijitu. Bana betu mbafi kapa. Toka kiti la. Mane tu deputy. Musa kumpala. E musa mubi bano kumu muni. Niku bishenga basi mbape chance. Ya bobo kupi ana lukasa. Kujimalo adi mashano bini lukana. Même si nous sommes tous les deux, nous sommes tous les deux. Nous sommes tous les deux, nous sommes tous les deux, nous sommes tous les deux. Nous sommes tous les deux. Now, these people want to avenge their chief from the Congolese overstep of power. So, they go about that violently. In my opinion, that's no way of going about things, but, and isn't, in fact, Black Lives Matter level thuggery, but I digress. Anyway, the role of the hereditary chief is essentially someone who overruns a city or borough that is traditionally connected to the people or civilization that was there prior to colonization. And because of this Congolese overstep of power, this violent movement happened. Well, let's see what Congolese authorities will use this. Let's see how Congolese authorities will use this to justify the things that they're justifying. DR Congo election risks delay due to violence, says the EC chief. Democratic Republic of the Congo's presidential election slated for late this year to choose a successor to President Joseph Kabila could be delayed because of persistent militia violence in central Congo, the election commission president said on Friday. The elections originally supposed to have been held on November 2, 2016, but were postponed when the government said it needed more time to register voters. Many analysts say further delays could rekindle violent anti kabila protests that resulted in dozens of deaths last year. Now, I've highlighted all the problem areas in red, and how do you like that? Just because there's violence and unrest over here and down there, that means that every province on the map that you see numbered cannot have human rights because the ones in red are having problems. Imagine if Barack Obama used this reasoning for America's election. That would be like any state where there's a Black Lives Matter march or a terror attack. Imagine if he suspended America's right to vote for months on end because there's problems in certain regions. Violence and civil unrest is no reason in any circumstances to delay an election. That only means that in the problem areas, the turnout rate would be much, much lower. There could still be people in the other provinces where there aren't any problems still voting and casting their ballots for one candidate or another. Just because there's nine problem areas, that shouldn't have to ruin it for the other 17. 
The DR Congo's President Joseph Kabila has joined residents of the capital Kinshasa on Sunday to register to vote in the controversial presidential election that has an uncertain date. The country's independent National Electoral Commission, CENI, has stated over registration process early this year after the United Nations mission airlifted 3,900 tons of election materials to 15 election centers throughout the country and distributed to 107 satellite stations. Already 24 million voters have registered out of the expected 45 million. The Provincial Executive Society of the CENI in Kinshasa, Anne-Marie Mukwayanzo, said. The CENI came under pressure last year to complete voter registration process ahead of the earlier slated November 2016 election date. Oh, sound familiar? They explicitly stated that they were unable to meet the election deadline due to a lack of resources. A court extended the mandate of Joseph Kabila, whose term expired in December last year. A peace agreement was reached for a unity government after a series of protests by the opposition who carried on Kabila to step down. He agreed not to alter the constitution to stand for a third term in office. However, his government says the $1.8 billion needed to organize the polls for this year was out of reach again. We went into why that's bull****. The election is expected to be held by at least early 2018. And if you think it's irrelevant, oh ho, I'm going to show you why it's relevant. Kabila says he never promised to hold elections in DR Congo. So, it's just a prank, bruh. I never promised anything. It's just a prank, bruh. I'm gonna carry on my father's rule because it's all just a prank, bruh. I don't want any elections. I just want to sustain my dictatorship. Anyway, Congolese President Joseph Kabila on Saturday said he had never promised anything about whether to hold elections in the DR Congo, seeming to back away from a deal to hold a vote this year. I have not promised anything at all, Kabila told the German weekly Der Spiegel in a rare media interview. I wish to organize elections as soon as possible. Yeah, but you say you've never promised elections, but now you're saying that you're organizing elections as soon as possible. So, it's either you never promised it, or you're covering your ass because now you look bad on the international stage. We want perfect elections, not just elections, he said, adding that the government was in the process of registering voters that it was going well. We want perfect elections. I'm sorry. Perfection is a fool's errand to pursue. Hell, even America's elections aren't perfect. Look at all the political mudslinging that happens every four years in this country. Even America's elections aren't perfect. Nothing can be truly perfect. It's just, that's just how the way things work. Noth everything is flawed. Even God is inherently flawed. On a side note, how I know God is flawed, well, the Bible pretty much contradicts itself in many, many places. You know, God is, you know, jealous of, you know, deities that came before him. You know, he's always stating that he's the sole cause without a cause. He created a world where there's apparently a lot of suffering because of the sins of the first two people, apparently. So even the concept of God is inherently flawed. For if God was real, he would be, have to be, flawed. Because the universe and everything around us is flawed in some way, shape, or form. Anyway, back to, back to the topic. Under a power-sharing agreement brokered by the influential Catholic Church on New Year's Eve, Kabila, 45, is due to remain in office until elections at the end of 2017. Ah, uh, now we see why he stays in power, so... Now we see why indeed. Mm -mm -mm. Now I didn't want to make people feel bad or to moral grandstand to say that I'm better than you. That wasn't the intent of this video. The intent was to make you feel grateful for the issues you have in your country. Now there may be elections and protesters and extremists here and there. But I just wanted to talk about this. So you could have something to be grateful for. That we have the issues that we have. That we have institutions that work. 
that we have people who don't become dictators. We should just be grateful for what we have, and that was the intent for this video. And I'm going to leave you with this. Would you rather live under Joseph Kabila or under Donald Trump? This is Tonstead 39, over and out. Mm -hmm.